Hello and welcome to UK Ed Chat After Hours. Um, this evening we are talking about a really interesting subject which before um, I did a little bit of research for this uh, webinar I didn't know anything about so I'm really quite excited about the topic uh, and we're talking about uh, um, quantitative load theory which I, I don't know much about it I can barely say it um, but uh, it's a really fantastic topic from what I've uh, gleaned from my little bit of research. So just to explain who I am, I'm Martin. I'm one of the people who makes UK EdChat happen every week on a Thursday evening. Uh, if you want to find out more about me, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at ICT Magic. If you want to find out more about UK EdChat, then again on Twitter, you can go to UK EdChat or you can go to UKEdChat.com. If you want to do even more than that, then you can find our Patreon page and you can support what we do to help teachers not just in the UK, but across the world. And uh, I'm really pleased to be joined by an expert in this field who can hopefully help me say the word and also know a little bit more about it. Um, so um, could I ask you to introduce yourself, please? Yeah. Hi there, Martin. So my name's Steve Garnett. Um, so briefly, uh, became a teacher in 1990, uh, spent about 20 years in the classroom, classroom teacher, Head of department, uh, deputy head, and then I moved into the world of uh, teacher training essentially. So I now uh, work as a freelance trainer and uh, I have the good fortune to work with many, many, many thousands of teachers now over the last sort of 10, 15 years. And I guess my specialist area is around teaching and learning. And uh, as a result of that interest, uh, I got involved uh, quite heavily in the last 18 months in cognitive load theory and its sort of practical application for day to day teaching. So uh, put this book together. Uh, just came uh, out in, uh, in September, yep. so uh, that's. Uh, well, I've done a little bit of work on it for sure. Okay, excellent. Um, just to say, this is an interactive session, so wherever you're watching uh, this video, then uh, you can ask questions, and we'll get those to Steve to follow up, or hopefully uh, to answer as we're discussing right now. Yeah. So um, don't be shy if you're not sure about any of this, then please do get in touch. Uh, also, any of the links, including uh, Steve's book, hold it up, hold it up, show people. Oh, oh, okay. um, uh, the book also uh, will be linked to you in the show notes. So wherever you're watching this, again, just follow the show notes and you can have a peruse uh, of the book, hopefully on Amazon and other places as well. So um, we've got a, a couple of questions to get through. And um, as I said, other questions that come in that we'll try to tackle as we can. So the first one is almost in a reverse. So what do you hope that people get from uh, our little presentation here? What takeaways would you like people to take away from uh, cognitive load theory? Yeah. Um, yeah, so essentially, I think, Martin, that the biggest thing that struck me is, as I said, teach of 30 years is, is how important an understanding of what's involved in cognitive load theory, um, how important it is in terms of just planning lessons, and I guess specifically uh, planning lessons through the lens of uh, youngsters who are in your classroom who, in the jargon now, I'm hearing them described as the novice. So a lot of the issues attached to uh, cognitive load theory are especially felt by novice learners um, who have no prior knowledge really in terms of whatever it is you're teaching today. Um, and I think it's that type of youngster that has the most to gain from a teacher who's got an awareness of what's involved in cognitive load theory. And probably crucially, the teacher then makes certain adjustments to the, the teaching approach, given their knowledge of issues around cognitive load. So I think the big thing to take for any teacher is a recognition that it's hugely influential and important Sort of consideration you know dynamic when teaching the novice learner essentially hmm. it's interesting to use the terminology novice does that suggest that the uh, the learner has very little knowledge about whatever's been teaching at the time so i'm thinking um maybe a very young child maybe at primary school or does it go all the way up to secondary school college university and beyond so yeah yeah so when i started um, sort of prepping uh, for the book and having to read around it and uh, I should probably say as well, um, it's sometimes described as Sweller's cognitive load theory. So Professor John Sweller uh, is a sort of the author of it. And uh, he very kindly, uh, on the back of an email I sent him actually um, end of last year, he sort of mentored me through it. And one of the things when we were talking 
uh, and emailing uh, and so on was about this idea that it's been tested in primary and secondary and older pupils. So a lot of the issues um, attached to sort of limited capacity and working memory, where, and perhaps we'll go on to that a little later, uh, mm -hmm. but um, all learners, in adults as well as younger learners, all experience the same limitations when processing essentially new stimulus, new learning. Mm. Okay, so before we have a deep dive into the topic, yeah. um, how would you summarize the theory and um, perhaps also tell us what it is not? Because obviously there are lots of misunderstandings about yeah. particular theories and this yeah. one probably in particular. Yeah, so um, I guess the best way to sort of uh, conceptualize it uh, from a teacher's point of view is, is to see, um, in a sense, the brain having two sort of components in terms of memory. So it's at the front of the brain, uh, the working memory, the sort of uh, the smaller part, and, and then broadly speaking, and it's a very broadly speaking, towards the back would be long term memory. So cognitive load theory is, is really focused on what's happening within working memory. So uh, in terms of what it is, it's, it's you know, it's, that's its central focus. Into, it, it looks at the limitations in working memory and then more crucially, there are certain things a teacher can do and there are certain things a teacher perhaps should avoid so that the teaching remains within the, uh, the limits of working memory. So in terms of what it is, uh, it's a theory, an instructional theory focused on what's going on in working memory. Uh, in terms of what it isn't, that, that's tricky in terms of what, what people bring. Um, in terms of doing the training, when you go to schools and work with teachers and so on, um, there's a lot of appetite around things like retrieval practice now and retrieval quizzes, rightly so. Um, so those sorts of techniques, I would say, are, are more focused on long-term memory and the strengthening retrieval in long-term memory, super important, of course, whereas the cognitive load stuff is, is very much, uh, I mean, they're, they're cousins and they're clearly linked, but the, the cognitive load stuff is, is really all about working memory and understanding limitations in uh, capacity, limited capacity in working memory and working around that. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask you to go into some of the history about it. You've already mentioned Sweller, yeah. uh, but we've had a question in. Uh, I don't know if this, because I know there are lots of different flavours of the yeah. theory and yeah. lots of different researchers have sort of gone in different directions with it. Uh, yeah. But the question's talking about dialogical learning. Is that something you've come across in your own research and in your book? Oh, yeah. Well, no. Um, I mean, I've come across, I think it's the Robin Alexander stuff on dialogical teaching or dialogic teaching, I think it is. Mm. Um, so no, that that wouldn't have found its way uh, in terms of uh, the cognitive load. Uh, I mean, essentially, seventy percent of my work has has focused around the, the the techniques that the cognitive load theorists have tested. Um, so no, um, that that wouldn't okay. be any reference at all. No, so, so, sorry about that. For, for that but, question. Um, Sophie has sent that question to us. So Sophie, educate us. Tell us more about it. That would be fantastic. We'll add it to our show notes. That's that's great to bring the conversation a bit further. OK, yeah. so could you maybe take us through some of the development of your particular strand of the theory, um, starting with Sweller and perhaps beyond? Yeah, so um, funny if I have a timeline right here. So um, I guess the, the thing that made me feel that there's something in this for you know as i described in the book the kind of a, a classroom teacher you know possibly teaching in an overcrowded classroom and delivering an overcrowded curriculum so you know i'm trying to see this whole thing of cognitive load through the lens of a busy teacher who's interested in sort of cognitive science but really the central question is tell me what i'm doing tomorrow with my my class um and so in terms of the, the history of it, um, and I think this is probably helpful in terms of putting markers down, um, the old, they, they, they've tested instructional uh, techniques, they call them effects, and, and the first one they tested was in 1982. Uh, the first one was a goal-free effect. Uh, and then up until my last one is 2013, so in that sort of essentially 30-year spell uh, 15 different effects have been sort of noted and, and labeled and identified uh, so it's a sort of 30-year um, history if you like um, and interestingly as Sweller himself said he said uh, when he first started pushing this idea of cognitive load theory and how it's a really important issue to to recognize within sort of teaching generally uh, he said he was ignored for 20 years and it's literally only in the last well six or seven years uh, he's, he's kind of come to the fore, uh, you know, in the minds of teachers and, and many of the people uh, attending the webinar 
perhaps uh, we'll, we'll know about a, a famous now Dylan William tweet in January 2017, where he said he's come to the conclusion that uh, Sweller's cognitive load theory is the single most important bit of uh, research uh, every teacher should know. And I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing his, his tweet there. So it's probably in the last three years, it's really become on the radar uh, of, of teachers possibly. Uh, because prior to that, nobody was ever asking me when I was doing training and so on about cognitive load. You know, I was never getting asked a question about it. I was never getting requests for training. So uh, it's been around a wee bit, Martin, you know, 30 years. Uh, but I think it's fair to say for most teachers, it's not been on their radar. Uh, and it's sort of in the last you know, couple of years or so, it, it surfaced as, as a, something to consider. Mm. It is fascinating how different ideas do come into fashion and sometimes yeah. go out of fashion. And you know, yeah. it, it may be, a, I don't know if it's because maybe we're looking at the individual as much more responsible for their own learning these days, where perhaps in the past, and I'm very much generalizing, it's much yeah. more um, chalk and talk at the front of the classroom. And that's obviously, I hope, uh, a long yeah a long a long ago in history now yeah. okay so um could you maybe expand on the theory and sort of have a really deep dive into it and what should everybody know um yeah. have a good monologue about yeah. um uh, uh, what you uh, what, what you've uh, researched and what you've put into your book what kind of thing should every teacher know for their yeah. own teaching so i think if i put myself back in a position of being a full-time teacher once again uh, you know, and benefiting from sort of what I've gained and, and, and learned about cognitive load theory. Uh, and as I say, and I keep coming back to this, because I think this is sometimes lost in the sense that it's really, really significant when you have got the novice learner in front of you. Youngsters that are more fluent, more expert, some of the things that are promoted within uh, cognitive load theory become, I would argue, sort of less important, uh, because if you have more knowledge, your working memory capacity actually increases. Uh, the, I mean, a simple, simple way of explaining that, Martin, if I asked you to, please don't, but if I asked you to, to recount a, a very, very, <laughs> uh, if I was going to ask you to tell me uh, about a, a major holiday that you've been on, you would wax lyrical for, for, for minutes and minutes and minutes about that. I could do the we'll same. Do <laughs> <laughs> I could do the same to you about my uh, holiday. But if I asked you to recount what you can remember from what I just said to you, you, you wouldn't be able to, because it's new learning, essentially, you know, my, my experience of my holiday, if I'm sharing that with you, that's new to you. Uh, in terms of me then asking you to, to share back what it is you can remember, because it was oral, you know, it was, you'd forget a lot, essentially. Uh, that's what everything about um, working memory limits suggests. When it's no lots, your working memory, i.e., what you're currently thinking about can process in a huge amount. But if you're a novice and it's new, it's very limited. Mm. So as a result of that kind of dilemma that when it's new learning, working memory is limited, the teacher, and this is really, I think, the, the, the useful practical stuff around uh, cognitive load, they've, they've sort of trialed and tested, as I say, 15 instructional approaches, they call them, and they all have names. Uh, and as a result of that, and I'll, I'll share some examples in a second, but Basically, as a result of testing all of these different approaches, they've been able to say, do you know what, if you do that, there's a popular phrase now, dual coding, That's and it's very similar in principle, but if, in, in very pedantic terms, the modality effect is, if I spoke and uh, gave you a spoken description of something and accompanied that with a visual, that auditory and visual um, processing um, allows the working memory to cope with far more than it ordinarily could for the novice. So uh, utilising the modality effect for the novice can be a way of cheating sort of inherent limitations in working memory. Um, one of the, A very popular technique that lots of teachers use would be uh, the worked example. Um, and they see the benefits for learners when they're learning a skill in, in the early stages of learning a skill. All teachers know intuitively that youngsters frequently benefit from seeing a worked example of what it is a teacher's talking about. So they then hopefully can eventually do one on their own. Well, the worked example effect is um, the second oldest. It's, you know, it's been well known for a long time that the sort of novice learner benefits hugely. Now, sort of cognitive load theory explains why they benefit from it. So the cognitive load theories are promoting heavily the power of things like the worked example, the power of the modality effect. Um, so they do by looking, you know, for the viewers by uh, 
looking for cognitive load effects as described by Sweller, um, you get a whole list of these things. And, and there's some things to be avoided, as I say, but in terms of pr promoting things, um, modality effect is one I frequently cite, um, I say the worked example. Uh, another nice one they talk about uh, for the novice learner, uh, they call it the isolated elements effect. But um, for people within the audience that may be familiar with Rosenshine's principles of instruction, that's becoming really quite popular at the moment. Uh, the second of the 10 principles that Rosenshine talks about um, is that um, Rosenshein recommended um, that new learning should be taught in small steps. Um, and actually, that's a nod to the fact that, because it's new learning, implicit in that is their youngsters are novices, because it's new learning. So he recognised with the second principle that if they're novices, new learning has to be delivered. It's chunking, essentially, by any other description, but he talks about the importance of small steps. Well, that plays perfectly to this isolated elements effect. When you isolate and chunk and, and make into small steps and break things down, the, the novice learner will benefit from that and working memory won't be, um, in a sense, overloaded. So there's, uh, you know, within the kind of, the, I think the interesting takeaways for teachers, interesting cognitive load, would be to have a look at the different effects that have been tested and, in a sense, take from that and, and adjust their teaching, you know, as a result of those, of what the effects are, are describing. So the, the three ones that I think I probably most regularly go back to would be the isolated elements effect, the modality effect, uh, and the worked example effect. And, and there are others, as I say, 15 in total. Okay, very interesting. So lots of it's coming from the idea um, you said about the worked example. And I think that the, the yeah. ancient world had the right idea with the mentors and you know, showing people how to do that kind of um skills uh with the the mentor and the mentee and working yeah. through the examples and things like that so that's fascinating yeah. that's it's that journey isn't it from novice to expert mm. it's kind of i'll show you i mean it is it's classically the i we you model that lots mm. of people uh, know uh, but yeah so it would support that and, and interestingly if i may just on that um because the danger can be with cognitive load that it's again that it's only focused on uh, the novice a lot of it is but equally, they have things to say about once the youngster's gone beyond the novice stage, then they're, they're more skilled. They're not expert yet, but they're getting there. So they start talking about other effects that have been tested. So they'll have something called um, a completion problem effect. Um, it's kind of like faded scaffolding, really. But they basically promote the idea that um, as learners become more expert, they benefit from seeing half a worked example or maybe seeing a range of different examples of the same skill. And by seeing it in a range of contexts, that makes it easy for them to, to understand what, you know, what the skill looks like and the, and the components of the skill. So they, they do, um, if you, you know, talk, they talk about the novice, but they do also um, test working memory limits for youngsters who have gone beyond the novice stage. Um, I mean, at its extreme, there's something they call the expertise reversal effect, uh, which is there is a danger, ultimately, uh, once youngsters have been exposed to worked examples, for the teacher to only ever give worked examples. And there's a, you know, that's a, there's a cautionary note to be had there that actually for youngsters who know what to do, they're not being well served by being given yet more worked examples. Indeed, they should, you know, you shouldn't give them any at all uh, because it can have a negative impact. That's a very simplistic description of, of the work, uh, the expertise reversal effect as it's called. But yeah, so they have some things to say around uh, working memory capacity for youngsters who are more on the journey to expert but the majority of it is focused on the novice learner and things to to do and not do um, for the novice learner. Mm. Okay, so from my research uh, of the literature, um, which yeah. is um, not in depth, and um, please do tell me if I'm wrong, but yeah. lots of the things that it mentioned, because I, I believe the theory came out of the idea of presentations and uh, the idea of busy PowerPoints and things along these kind of lines. Yeah, yeah. Um, there seem to be lots of uh, don'ts in the literature. Um, yeah. Could you maybe tell me more about the, the do's? What kind of things that, obviously, you've already talked about the idea of chunking and the, the idea of making steps yeah. and things like that, but yeah. um, perhaps you can go into that aspect a little bit. Yes, later. some more. I mean, just, just to pick up, again, for, for the viewers, really, um, I kind of very, as I say, it's probably should be called Sweller's Cognitive Load Theory in my book because it is the Sweller stuff. Um, yeah. I know before we spoke today, uh, in preparation for today, Martin, um, another um, very sort of eminent uh, cognitive load theorist uh, from the States, Richard Mayer. So um, 
he would talk about principles, um, whereas uh, Sweller talks about effects. So I'm just thinking uh, he has something, um, it's very difficult to say. I know you, you were laughing about the, the pronunciation, but here, have a go with this one then. Uh, so it's the uh, contingency um, principle, I think he calls it. But, but essentially, um, Sweller describes it as a split attention effect. Um, whereas Mayer uh, describes the same phenomena, but he has a different language. It's, uh, sorry, temporal continuity. I, I'm not an expert in this in, in his work. Um, mm. So uh, he has principles, whereas uh, Sweller has effects, really. Uh, but they both describe the same phenomena. So as in, in terms of a don't, split attention, one example of it is um, never to have labels for a diagram too far apart. Mm. Um, because that, for the novice, uh, essentially there's too much working memory uh, sort of capacity being taken up trying to get the labels much more integrated with the with the, the, the diagram richard mayer calls that a temporal contiguity i think that's how i pronounce it i'll have to double check uh principle so uh yeah there are as you say in the literature there's lots of other people doing the work on on cognitive yeah. load mayer being a big one and he does a lot of work on multimedia um teaching and learning uh, and does draw some similar uh, conclusions. Things like the redundancy effect uh, is a big one uh, for the novice learner. Um, and again, redundancy effect, I think has a redundancy principle, so that's very similar language. But yeah, it's a big no-no uh, for the novice learner. There's a lot now around sort of worksheet design, just not overfilling um, stimulus with, Frank. I don't say unhelpful, but um, information that's not directly related to what you want them to learn them to, uh, what they want you want them to learn today so things like the redundancy effect uh, is, a, is a catch-all term to be a really for the teacher to be really critical in terms of the material that uh, you're giving the youngsters when you look at that material is there anything in there that actually isn't directly helping the learning for today and they think they talk about sort of emojis or sort of lots of colored boxes that don't carry any meaning um, I mean, I'm probably opening a can of worms there in terms of worksheet design, but yeah, the more you can be a critical kind of consumer of the resources you're giving to pupils, and, and less is more actually is 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 a really good kind of a way I think of thinking about the redundancy principle. Less okay, is, less can often be more. Mm, okay, that's really helpful. Right, we've had a question in from Richard. Um, I'm summarising this, um, but he's basically asking, what would you recommend uh, for supporting SEND students with poor working memory? Um, do you have any experience of that? Yeah, so that, that's really interesting because um, a fair bit of my work involves just working with TAs and learning support assistants. And uh, I don't tell them this, but um, some of the things I promote are directly linked to um, cognitive load theory. So, for example, um, it, again, uh, Richard, was that Richard? I think he said. Yes, Richard, uh, yeah. yeah. So, Richard, if, uh, if you had the opportunity, if you uh, went on to... Uh, YouTube and you Googled uh, Dr. Fred Jones, there's a wonderful three minute video clip of uh, an American teacher trainer who's retired now, but he's promoting uh, the use of something called a visual instructional plan, a picture for every step. So the video shows him training some teachers, but he's modeling the idea that uh, he was doing some long uh, division and he was saying to the teachers that when you're trying to teach this kind of thing, so this is the sort of the send uh, dimension, uh, trying to break all the steps down uh, as he calls it a picture for every step and sort of mastering each step before you progress on to the next one um, is, is a really good um, you know, device uh, to support learners who are really you know at the very start in terms of mastering a skill or a method or a strategy so uh, as I say that plays love really well to the isolated elements um, effect that's been tested but in terms of nuts and bolts uh, teaching tomorrow uh, if you embrace this kind of idea, whether it's a written skill or a maths uh, method, if you think about a picture for every step and you're breaking down the you know, individual components, um, I, I'd argue that's a, an amazing strategy for uh, all pupils, but particularly the SEND pupils, a picture for every step, a VIP. That's, I say, Dr. Fred Jones has a wonderful uh, three minute, uh, if you Google that, it's um, Creating lessons, the, the effective effective lessons, I think, something like that. But Dr. Fred Jones, you, you, you'll, you'll get across it. Three minutes. Okay, we'll, we'll try and find it and put it in the show notes so um, yeah. people can have a look at that. Okay, my final question um, is, what would the physical space of the classroom look like if it was designed with uh, CLT? I'm saying it like yeah. that this time, um, <laughs> in mind. Yeah, so I, I, was, I was 
having a good think about this because, as I say, the vast majority of the effects are testing instructional techniques, as it were. But notwithstanding that, um, the two big ones uh, that came to mind really would be um, the, the, the use of the space either side of your whiteboard. Um, and it's really um, maybe keep the displays and so on and the more sort of celebratory work out of the, uh, the gaze, the direct sort of eyesight of, of the students and, and use that space um, for just absolute key learning related to what you're doing now. I, I, I once heard um, the space either side of the whiteboard described as the teacher's silent helper. And I didn't really know what that meant. And what it was saying is that uh, your peripheral vision is, without you realising, is picking up whatever's on either side of the whiteboard, even though your directed vision is looking at the whiteboard and what the teacher's doing. So, um, as I say, it's described as the teacher's silent helper. So it, just in terms of um, kind of manipulating the environment to, to sort of promote learning and content or words or whatever it might be, uh, almost subliminally, actually, I guess, uh, into the youngster's mind. That might be an interesting one, just to consider the, the, the kind of learning space either side of your whiteboard. Uh, as, as I say, the teacher's silent helper. So um, that might be something to consider. It's not really in terms of, uh, as I say, I'm certainly trying to offer some ideas, but uh, this wouldn't be something that's been tested, for example, uh, in terms of cognitive load theory. Um, but one of the ones they do promote uh, as a, a thing to do, they call it the collective working memory effect. Uh, and probably intuitively so, and teachers would know this, but they have tested and again, it's probably an obvious thing to say, but it has been tested that uh, if I ask an individual to recall as much as they can, you'll get X amount. But if I then ask four to put their collective heads together and share what they can collectively um, re recall, you'll get more. Well, I think any teacher in the world will say that's obvious, but, as, but they've tested it and it's got a name, as I say, collective working memory effect that was uh, labeled in 2009. So in terms of your classroom arrangement, um, just maybe either, I mean, many teachers will um, sort of default to groups of four. Lots have rows. So um, having groups of four, um, whether you have that as your default position or you frequently move to fours to do a sort of a, I guess, think, pair, share is, is, a, is a very popular strategy. It's the same kind of idea. But uh, yeah, so just in terms of, you know, manipulating the classroom environment, um, the two that I felt you know, would play to some of this might be uh, to, to build into the collective working memory effect, having been fours, and then maybe explore that sort of notion of, you know, the silent helper on either side of the whiteboard, uh, just just sort of promoting learning and, and content. And it's just been absorbed uh, through peripheral vision, really, even though their directed vision is uh, focused on today's lesson and today's content. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you very much for that. That's um, really helpful to have those really concrete tips that people can try out uh, in their own classrooms. That's really good. Right. Um, so um, can you just remind people uh, what the name of your book is? Uh, <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Explore it some more? Yeah, so uh, I, I would just say as well, if I just might, uh, there's a wonderful um, uh, uh, sort of review here from Professor Sweller himself. Uh, so um, mm. Yes, I'm just a teacher, uh, you know, researching this, but I, it felt massively reassuring that the world's authority uh, had some very kind things. I think the publishers were quite <laughs> pleased to see that as well. So, yeah, just uh, cognitive load. Thank you for that, Martin, uh, allowing me to. That's great. Uh, um, and that. if people want to find out more about you or um, some of your work, um, do you have any presence on the web that you could share with people? Uh, not really. I think... Um, it's Crown House Publishing, who published this, they would have my, my contact details. So if there's anything, yep. uh, um, that would be wonderful, of course. But uh, yeah, they, they could get hold of me through Crown House Publishing uh, very easily. OK, um, so if you've got any questions for Steve that you want to ask via UK Ed Chat, then if you um, contact us uh, through our many different platforms, then please do so and we'll pass those on to Steve um, yeah. so he can try to answer you back. And that'd be I fantastic. Would. Yeah. So. Um, thank you ever so much for talking to us and educating everybody, especially me, because this is a topic I haven't really come across before. So thank you yeah. ever so much. Thanks, for that. Martin. No, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, thank you everyone, everybody, for watching, and goodbye.